Hello, so I'm back with my lecture. So we're going to continue our discussion of kind of post now, post 54 Vietnam and the what is known in Vietnam as the American War, but in, uh, in the United States is called the Vietnam War. And so you can see from this um, uh, slide that I'm showing you here, it's maybe hard to see, um, but between 1965 and 1970, you can see the American troops came from the sea uh, or by planes and uh, against the coast uh, along uh, the coast of Vietnam and set up military bases along the coast. But the Vietnamese themselves created uh, their own sort of highway, if you will, or navigation route along the mountains and called the, the Ho Chi Minh Trail. And the Americans did not have access really to that trail because it was very difficult to find. And uh, from the air, they were not able to really visibly see where the Vietnamese were. So they started dropping bombs on, on the country and bombed uh, you know, millions of tons of bombs uh, onto the, or thousands of tons of bombs onto the country and still unsuccessfully really um, um, deterring the Vietnamese who continued to move down from the north into the southern part of the country to, in their words, in Vietnamese words, to liberate the south from the Americans. And so what was a kind of independence war against the French became a liberation war under the um, Americans. And also another word that is used in Vietnamese is a reunification. So their goal was to bring the two separate halves of Vietnam together into one nation. Now the the Americans were very violent. Um, the the and this is very well known outside of Vietnam that America kind of failed to really be peaceful about their um, uh, attacks on on Vietnam. Of course, no attacks can be peaceful, but there were no negotiations. But there was also a lot of confusion, and uh, Americans um, couldn't tell the difference between. Uh, a communist Vietnamese and a non-communist Vietnamese. They couldn't tell the difference between soldiers and civilians, and they end up attacking civilians um, uh, left and right. And one very famous event took place at a village called My Lai, where women and children uh, were killed. Um, none of them were soldiers or communist party members. And uh, it wouldn't, it would have not been uh, called to attention if it were not for one of the witnesses of this battle who denounced the soldiers that had perpetrated this crime, and and it became known as a kind of a war crime, except that the the perpetrators were not prosecuted, but it be, did make the newspaper. Now the Vietnam War reporters were given free reign around the country to actually report on the war. A lot of photographers um, came to Vietnam to take photographs uh, of the war. Um, there were the press and in back in the United States was very eager to, um, uh, very eager to uh, report or receive coverage. The public in America was very curious about the war because they didn't understand it. It was a country far away. There was a lot of division and polarization and a lot of controversy around the war. And it, unlike you know, back in the 50s with McCarthy, where he succeeded in convincing people that communism was bad, people increasingly did not believe that the war was any good. And there were huge protests against the war in the United States and the president was kind of losing uh, a battle at home. A lot of artists in America um, made posters um, denouncing the soldiers' uh, actions. Um, here's a poster that was taken from a photograph after the My Lai massacre. They also used you know, a lot of um, these kinds of images to show how brutal and macho 
um, the Americans were um, showing, you know, this uh, penis and cannons, tanks. Um, a lot of the language around warfare is, of course, very masculine. And uh, so the artists kind of took a, a lot of uh, liberties trying to convince people how bad the war was. Today, actually, Milai is a site of tourism, either uh, veterans, war veterans come and try to make amends, or actually it's um, a site for people who only know Vietnam because of the war. Uh, they come to, to Vietnam just out of curiosity and not really interested in Vietnam on its own, but more because it was a war, and that's how Vietnam was in the popular imagination in the United States. People also go to sites, for instance, where the tunnel, tunnels were built. The Viet Cong, as they became known, the Communist Party of Vietnamese, built this series of tunnels, um, underground tunnels where they could hide. Uh, so the Americans were bombing from the sky, but they actually didn't succeed in spotting the Vietnamese because the Vietnamese were very clever at hiding from the bombs and the bombing in the planes. And one of the more clever ways were these tunnels. So now tourists can actually go and um, visit these tunnels and uh, just kind of as part of war tourism. Um, soldiers and American soldiers in Vietnam also um, smoked a lot. They also smoked, um, you know, cigarettes and marijuana, but they also were suffering because it was very, um, uh, you know, the the war was very traumatic for them. They witnessed uh, horrific uh, crimes, but also they witnessed death. And there were often young soldiers that were recruited or drafted by the Americans. So there's a, there's a, a there were a number of lighters at this time. Um, Zippo made this famous kind of uh, kind of lighter that was a pocket lighter that you could that, you know flipped open so it was kind of sleek and it could fit into your pocket uh, for smokers and what uh, soldiers started doing was carving things on them and after the war was over uh, farmers would find these lighters in the field so it either meant that soldiers had died there or they had left them there and they began to sell them on the market and so tourists are buying these uh, lighters which is a bit grim you know idea and then you don't know if they're real or fake but it also seems grim to buy a lighter from a soldier who might have died um, a lot of uh, art works were made um, after the war was over. Um, sorry, uh, as several exhibitions were made after the war was over to kind of highlight this uh, time period uh, when soldiers were in Vietnam, um, but also in attempts at reconciliation somehow because. At the end of the war in 1975, um, and the time, you know, Vietnam went into uh, seclusion. Uh, there was an embargo uh, imposed on Vietnam, a uh, trade embargo, a kind of punishment for winning the war until economic reforms in the late 1980s took place. So during that time, uh, Vietnam was kind of closed, but also Vietnam was seen as the enemy and uh, Americans, didn't quite know how to reconcile with Vietnam. So it took individual artists, curators, and individuals to try to reconcile with Vietnam. And one uh, artist who, had, who was a, recruited as a soldier decided to make this exhibition called As Seen by Both Sides, or inviting artists from America who had protested the war, and then artists that he met in Vietnam on a trip, on a return trip, um, and exhibited them side by side. And then there was another exhibition at the Drawing Center in New York in 2005 um, that sh showed uh, drawings, uh, mostly from private collections, sketches that were made uh, during the war by different Vietnamese artists. And it was the first time that people in the United States had seen these, these drawings and 
heard the voices of the Vietnamese because they had really only known about American soldiers. But that's in America, but in Vietnam itself, there's also been different ways of, of kind of mem memorializing the war or coming to terms with the war. So there was this patriotic view of the war, for sure. Um, but there was also uh, a, a, a patriotic view, but there's also an, a, a kind of sentimental emotional view of the war and a very individualistic view of the war. So there are films that were made about the war did not show graphic details of bombs or not like some movies that the Americans made uh, like Apocalypse Now that just focused on American soldiers and the Vietnamese people practically don't exist in those films or they're just bombed to death. Instead, Vietnamese films showed, for instance, in the film on the, on the, on the left, this little girl, it's called Little Girl from Hanoi, who uh, comes home from school and her finds out her street has been bombed. And but the whole movie is seen from her perspective as a little girl kind of crying, looking for her family and doesn't find them. There's another film that was made um, when the 10th month comes. That's about a woman whose husband is at war. She lives with her in-laws and she gets a letter from, um, from the military saying that her husband had died, but she, she's worried about telling her in-laws because she thinks they'll be heartbroken. So she keeps the information to herself and kind of lies to them about his death. And so she has to privately mourn him and show a good face. And so this film was very popular because it showed the situation that everybody found themselves in, but also the kind of ambivalence that Vietnamese citizens felt in following kind of the state's idea of, of the war, you know, as hero. So that, that painting I showed you of the woman standing there in front of the wreckage that's kind of showing that even though there's violence, you still have to soldier on. Um, this film was showing that you have you have to be able to cry. You have to be able to mourn your loved ones without feeling like everybody has to be a hero. So after the war, so these are some pictures that I took um, in in 1990s. Um, after the war, um, the uh, the landscape of um, Hanoi uh, still, you know, had remnants uh, of the war. Um, there, um, there was still um, uh, war wreckage uh, in 1992 that they had not yet removed. Um, but the country was extremely um, poor, um, extremely um, uh, decimated by the war. And uh, because uh, Vietnam did not have um, uh, access to contacts um, in the West um, that because of the embargo, the only uh, relations they had with international countries were Soviet bloc communist countries that actually ended in the late 1980s after the end of the Cold War and the fall of the Berlin Wall and the dissolution of the Soviet Union. So um, Vietnam was you know, very poor. Uh, people went around on bicycles, as you can see here when I came in 1992. You could still see signs of the war. Um, there's still a statue of Lenin um, in Hanoi. There were a lot of sculptures uh, to heroes. Um, this one it says, is, thanks for those who sacrificed themselves for the war. Um, there, um, sculptures um, that are fashioned along the lines of, you know, patriotism and nationalism. The um, statue on the right is actually of a king of the 17th century who had fought against the Chinese. You can see this kind of monumental sculpture. And then on the left is also a sculpture of a woman who had protected her, her citizens from the enemy. And then the one in the middle shows the kind of image of a, uh, a young woman soldier bringing uh, supplies and materials to um, her troops. And then there are umpteen um, monuments to the dead in Vietnam. 
um, that are not individualized, that are kind of collectives. So recognizing the sacrifices of individuals in a kind of public memorial that doesn't have anybody's name. Um, these are in every village and uh, every uh, region of Vietnam has these uh, monuments that, that celebrate the kind of heroism of the public um, in the face of the enemy. And there are a lot of posters that were made also uh, promoting this heroism. So this is different from that film that I mentioned. This is showing that you know the recognition of what so for instance, on the left is a, is a photograph of a woman who uh, takes an American soldier prisoner and uh, uh, she, you know, he's much larger than she is, um, but he bows down as he admits defeat. And then in the poster that was made of the same uh, event, the woman soldier is made much larger and the American soldier is made much smaller, uh, but does show that she has become huge in her heroism, her heroic act. There's a book that was written uh, about women's participation in the, in the war called Even the Women in Fight during the Everybody Had to Mobilize in Fight. And women heroes are uh, appear in a lot of the propaganda posters. Um, and showing, you know, the, the, the them as standing in for the nation, as kind of mothers to all, all uh, Vietnamese, but showing how heroic uh, they are. Sometimes they're named by name, especially if they if they sacrifice their lives for the cause. And a lot of paintings are made in celebrating these victories. The one on the right shows the presidential palace where the uh, president of the South ruled. Of course, after reunification, after the end of the war, the Northern Vietnamese flag, which is the red and blue flag, is replaced by the red only and yellow star flag. And here people are celebrating victory um, over the Americans, over the South. Um, the one on the left also shows, you know, women bringing flowers. So there's this celebration of the victory. After um, the end of the war uh, in 1975, um, the Vietnamese invited Soviet architects to build Ho Chi Minh's tomb. So uh, Ho Chi Minh died in 1969 um, uh, during the war, but he was not buried. In, in, in at that, that year, his body was preserved and kept and, and, and is still kept today. And uh, is so he was uh, placed in this mausoleum, a kind of a temple uh, where people could come visit him and you can still view his body today. And then next to him is a museum with all of his great uh, actions towards the nation. The Soviets also built a friendship palace to show their support of uh, Vietnam and the recognition of Vietnam as a communist ally with the Soviet Union. And then the, the, the Soviets also built apartment blocks uh, for the Vietnamese, um, but those quickly became dilapidated and today are practicing in and so this short time Modern high rises in this area. Uh, poster art is extremely popular in the public following of the Soviet um, Glorifying Ho Chi Minh, uh, glorifying his achievement. Celebration 
for the anniversary of the Communist Party, showing that all kinds of people, ethnic minorities included, workers, women, all religions and all Vietnamese citizens are um, uh, uh, join the Communist Party and are grateful to Ho Chi Minh. There's also this image on the left that shows that after the war, tanks are kind of turned into fuel for tractors and into agriculture. So um, war is no longer a priority. You can kind of convert uh, tanks into um, beneficial production for the country. The poster on the right shows three women from three different parts of the country also celebrating this new Vietnam that has been built better than before and that the, again showing rather than showing the devastation of the war and the destruction of the war it's showing this positive or shedding a positive light on the country as it becomes um, you know a, a better and improved version of the country um, the one on the left shows you know the spirit of the ancestors helping people to fight the enemy enemy the poster on the right says we will always uh, be grateful to Ho Chi Minh that we can all read. And this shows an ethnic minority woman, a Hmong woman, uh, who is actually reading Vietnamese. So there's this campaign to educate uh, ethnic minorities and they're you know, crediting Ho Chi Minh for that, even though he didn't necessarily, wasn't necessarily involved in that, but he did promote literacy. And then um, there is a museum that was built uh, in Ho Chi Minh City to also um, teach about the war. And uh, it was called initially the American War Crimes Museum because it was um, intended to accuse the United States, you know, rightfully of uh, destroying a lot of the country and invading the country, attacking and killing uh, two million Vietnamese and so forth. But after tourists started coming to Vietnam, it's now got changed the name to the War Remnants Museum, um, still highly visited by American tourists who are interested in, in the history of the war. And so it's very didactic. It shows photographs of uh, Vietnamese being uh, killed uh, or attacked by Americans. It, it, it intends to show how cruel the Americans were and tries to portray uh, the Vietnamese as victims. Um, and uh, it also showed the solidarity um, they received with um, uh, populations around the world uh, that supported uh, the Vietnamese against the Americans and were protested the war. Um, so this shows, you know, stop the bombing, get out of Vietnam. So there were protests against the war around the world. So they capture that, um, showing, you know, in Europe, all of the movements to support the Vietnamese against the Americans and um, showed also some sculptures uh, that were made. Um, this one, it's called Mother, um, there was this recognition that um, not just women contributed to the war effort, but mothers made sacrifices and that they lost their sons to the war. And so they were um, promoting this idea that women sacrificed more than the men because the men died, yes, but women lost their sons, their husbands, and then women also lost their lives and also had to fight. Um, here's a, you know, an array or a display of the photographers who died in the war. So it's interesting because while the Americans uh, had a lot of photographers, these are also include American photographers who covered the war, who were um, um, recognized for photographing the war, but they're not necessarily seen as having lost their lives or sacrificing themselves also to the war effort. Um, this is also some um, uh, showing the denouncing Americans very specifically, showing the cost of each war that the United States was involved in, World War II, the Korean War, and then the Vietnam War, how many um, uh, military personnel were um, sent there, how long the war was. So uh, three years for 
World War II, but 17 years in the Vietnam War, for instance, um, $340 billion for the World War II, $676 billion for Vietnam War, so trying to show how many casualties also, et cetera. Now, in the United States, the veterans who sacrificed their lives in Vietnam are memorialized in Washington, D.C. at a monument called um, the Vietnam Veterans Memorial. And this monument does not acknowledge the Vietnamese, it's just the Americans who died during the war. And this particular monument was very controversial when it was built. It was, there was a competition for um, the design of the uh, monument and it was a blind competition. So the name of the person was not revealed immediately. And it was a student, a Yale University architecture student who won it and who happened to be Chinese American, Maya Lin, won the competition based on her drawings. And her drawings were very simple, just showing this uh, V-shaped um, uh, form black uh, in black granite on the ground. And the viewers would come and uh, walk down slowly down this slope and see all of the names of the soldiers who died. And now it is one of the most visited monuments on the mall, on the mall. but at the time that it was built, it was seen as, as not uh, showing the heroism of the American, of the soldiers. It was seen as, it was called a, a black gash of shame, a kind of a scar in the ground. Um, and it was, seen as symbolizing death, which it was, but the veterans wanted something more heroic. And they wanted to have that positive spin that the Vietnamese showed to, towards their death. And instead they, they, they got this. So it's interesting because in, I was in Ho Chi Minh City in 2015, which was the 40th anniversary of the War of Reunification. And it seemed there weren't that many people on the street celebrating. 40 years is a long time. Many of the young people you know, were not born then, of course, but also their parents may have not really talked about the war. Most, you know, the country has been rebuilt and moved on from there. So it's not something that young people are conscious of, or it's not necessarily part of their daily vocabulary and yet the government continues to hold these celebrations and uh, celebrate the anniversary of the end of the war posters are still made but one friend told me yeah but these posters they are just photocopied and photoshopped they're not made by real artists anymore so the 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 kind of zeal and the enthusiasm for political art has definitely died uh, since uh, since the, the actual war period. And instead, actually, there are young people who are more kind of interested in pointing out the, the negative aspects of the government, or they're more interested in the contradictions and the ambiguities. They're not interested in heroism anymore. So around that time, there was also an exhibition that took place outside of Hanoi by contemporary artists called Bravo, kind of mocking the political propaganda and making kind of satires of propaganda and um, satires of the kind of vocabulary that, it, that is in the posters. Um, they also were wanted to denounce China, for instance, the poster in the middle there shows a China that is kind of trying to eat Vietnam. And that is not really apparent in some of the posters, but at that time in 2015, uh, China was um, uh, fighting with Vietnam over islands in the South China Sea. And so they were saying, why is the government not denouncing that? And so they're kind of making fun of, uh, of them. And then there are some contemporary painters who also have been making fun of this kind of uh, socialist realist propaganda. So Fan Hui Tong, who shows these babies um, holding up a Mercedes, and there's like tons of money around because he's denouncing corruption. 
and that a lot of government officials are actually extremely corrupt. Then Yuen Man Hong shows these very in this very naturalistically drawn airplane, um, fueled by cucumbers and carrying grocery bags instead of bombs, kind of mocking this contradiction between heroism of communism and then this intense capitalism that exists in Vietnam. Same with Hamantan, kind of showing um, uh, mocking this pop art or global a pop art and global capitalism but in a showing mixing it with nationalism and vietnamese icons and then bui con hain also does these like beautiful ceramics and yet he includes sort of um, um images from popular culture in there just to show how confusing it is to understand who is vietnamese or what is vietnamese culture is it this hyper patriotic nationalism is it traditionalism or is now in the era of globalization is it also capitalism and consumerism um Nguyen man hung who's also a performer and an artist and painter uses a lot of english language he does these um hyper realist paintings um with fighter jets carrying grocery bags and so he's kind of this image of the an artist who was born in 1975, he never fought in the war, but he's kind of eager for Vietnam to uh, re-identify itself as a, you know, a, a, as a player in the global world and doesn't carry on this this image of of, of resisting uh, foreign aggression. Um, he had a residency in France where he bought these uh, paintings that he found at a flea market and inserted. Um, kind of um, pop uh, icons in there and as also kind of layering um, the different kinds of styles of painting and also uh, imagery. And then a more well-known uh, artist, uh, Din Kule, who was born in Vietnam right during the war in 1968 and with his family, they moved to the United States because they were not communist. They were from the South fleeing communism and then he ended up coming back uh, in 2000 to Vietnam because he realized that Vietnam was changing and um, he thought it would be interesting to move back to his country and he's become an extremely successful artist. And he started his success by with these photo weavings where he wove together photographs of uh, Vietnam War images with uh, photojournalistic images. He also found in the markets of Ho Chi Minh City um, photographs of people. He didn't know where they were from, and so he made this kind of tapestry with them. So he's reflecting a little bit on this legacy of war imagery and 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 um, and its kind of emptiness in people's minds, like they don't really remember anymore, or they've forgotten, or it's become conflated with. Hollywood and with the press. Um, so he has titles of his work like Persistence of Memory, but also Erasure, like what is forgotten, what is remembered. And he also made this series of works um, about uh, the damage that Agent Orange did to um, the population. So Agent Orange was a defoliant, a toxic chemical that the v Americans dropped onto uh, the forests of Vietnam to uh, shed the leaves and they believed that they would therefore be able to see the enemy more clearly from the sky if the trees stopped having leaves and that did extremely uh, environmental damage to the country but it also harmed uh, women and children and especially pregnant women who gave birth to conjoined twins or babies with all kinds of deformities because it was such a toxic poison. So he made this series also, this, this work um, honoring, if you will, these conjoined twins. This is Agent Orange, you know, it's called Orange because of the color and to just show you how it just got rid of all of this forest. He also did a series on uh, memory where he embroidered uh, photographs of prisoners from Cambodia, but he also encouraged people to touch 
the um, cloth, and so the more they touched the white thread on the white uh, cloth, the more the image would reveal itself. So um, very consciously thinking about memory. He also did this work called The Farmer and the Helicopters, where uh, he found a farmer who decided to build its, his own helicopter from scrap metal that he found in his fields. And he decided that the helicopter should not be a bad image, but rather should be a positive image. So he's been doing these photographs uh, or weavings, and here he's kind of elongated photographs too. Um, they all have to do with sort of the imagery uh, of the war. And then he started, he, he's quite successful as an artist, so he started also collecting some of these drawings uh, from artists, or sometimes they're found, uh, sketches that artists made uh, during the war. And here he exhibited them at one of the more um, well-known or contemporary art exhibitions in Germany that takes place every five years. And he also made a film um, uh, about the, uh, the artists interviewing the artists who recollect their time during the war. And he tries to capture their enthusiasm for the war effort, their enthusiasm and their belief. The, the title, Light and Belief, is the belief in Ho Chi Minh and their belief in the cause of nationalism. And he, he made this film thinking perhaps that it was slightly ironic that today nobody believes in Ho Chi Minh anymore or they don't seem to believe in Ho Chi Minh anymore. There's no war to fight. There's global capitalism. And so why, you know, why, uh, why continue to believe in Ho Chi Minh when there's no kind of relevance to the present? So this is um, uh, clips from the, from the film and some of uh, the sketches like the ones I showed you much earlier. And then another uh, artist uh, who was born uh, at right at the end of the war, uh, Yan Va, whose um, family was Catholic from the South. And they left by boat and ended up in Denmark. So he grew up in Denmark. So he has an unusual perspective also on his Vietnamese identity, but he's been collecting uh, objects that date to the uh, war period, and some of them actually have quite symbolic meaning. For instance, he bought this chandelier that hung above the table where the Paris peace accords uh, took place. And the Paris peace accords were the moment when America had to admit defeat and had to agree to give the country back to the communists and it took a series of negotiations so he's uh, he's interested also in catholic sculpture he goes back to vietnam and collects things and then he mixes them up with other sculptures and he he here he has his his father's watch and then also a lighter there in a box he makes them look like very uh, luxurious aesthetic objects and so they're loaded with history. So he kind of, just by exhibiting the object itself is kind of a, um, a, a way of illustrating this, the, the, the legacy of the war, and, but in much more subtle ways. Another Vietnamese who, grew, who was born during the war um, and then emigrated first to France and then the United States, and Mille is quite well-known photographer and she first went back to Vietnam in uh, 1996 and wanted to kind of capture her memories as an adult of the Vietnam that she had left behind, that she had not seen. And then she also became very interested in the whole machinery of war and started, took, play, took, took pictures of soldiers who were reenacting the war. So this is in America in uh, the forests of Virginia, so this is not in Vietnam at all, there are people who actually are playing war in some way. And so the photographs look very strange um, because you think that it's real war going on, but in fact, it's kind of quote unquote fake war. And then another half Vietnamese, half French um, comic book artist 
lived in Vietnam in the South when his father was actually working for the South Vietnamese government and was married to a French woman. And so as a child in 1961, 63, he witnessed, you know, some the war. And so he tells kind of the story of his memories of the war, but yet he also, of course, doesn't remember everything. So he uh, uh, inserts <clears throat> uh, images from history or history books um, into his kind of comic strip. So he interweaves his family's story his and, and, and his own personal story here with his brother. They're like playing war. And then they move to London and during that time, of course, the Vietnam War protests take place. So he's witnessing kind of the anti-war movement from London and he intersperses some music and a relative that comes to visit from the South. And you can see here, he has a Zippo lighter. So it's kind of the perspective of a child um, in, on the war, but also it, it actually gives a very interesting account of history. Um, uh, through a kind of graphic novel or comic. And this, this image is interesting because he's wearing a t-shirt that is the flag of, of reunified Vietnam. Uh, but in the back, he has a, uh, um, an, uh, a reproduction of the Southern Vietnamese flag, the yellow with the red stripes. And so, and then he has Woodstock, sort of the peace movement. So, he, it shows that he's disconnected from the real Vietnam too, but he's half Vietnamese. And so it all becomes kind of mixed in together as he experiences uh, popular culture. And then he ends these on um, with um, independence and you know the contemporary Vietnam with these marches and the heroism. Comic uh, book art is very uh, popular uh, right now in Southeast Asia. This is a Singaporean who also uh, was interested in capturing kind of history through comic books because the comic book gives you um, an advantage in that you're drawing, you can, you can kind of mess with reality a little bit. You can kind of fantasize about um, uh, the real real events, but both these artists kind of make you know mix in the press and you know journalism and uh, actual historical events, and then turn it into kind of graphic uh, novels, and they're very powerful. And this is about uh, kind of challenging the um, in the first prime minister of Singapore, Lee Kuan Yew who was also anti-communist, who kind of come full circle, who allied himself with Americans, again, Americans against the communists and uh, led this campaign to um, imprison the communists and did not give them um, uh, any say or any trial. And so following kind of American tactics of uh, uh, depriving people of freedom of expression and freedom of speech in the name of global democracy. And this uh, moment was called uh, in 1963 Operation Cold Store where all of the communists were arrested even though this is uh, um, a democratic country uh, or it actually claims to be a democratic country but is in fact quite authoritarian. And a film was made recently to Singapore with love that interviews some of these um, prisoners that actually ended up going into exile. And then finally, the um, Indonesian film that was made a few years ago called The Act of Killing is also a recreation of the anti-communist um, crackdown in Indonesia in the uh, 1960s. So we will stop there briefly um, and um, sorry.